Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing series of stories about Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we're dealing with one of the biographical accounts of, of people who made a difference over time in Pensacola and our, our subject today is Nathan Burrell Cook. Now, Mr. Cook is remembered, uh, oh, in a, in a slight way, I guess, because we still have a wonderful school that is named after him. But unfortunately, Mr. Cook has been gone for, well, almost a century, and uh, his many accomplishments have been, well, sort of pushed into the background. But today, let's, let's talk about a remarkable man who, to, to me at least, we owe the credit of founding the real school system, the public school system for Escambia County. Now, Nathan Burrell Cook was born, uh, was born in Alabama, uh, he had a, a basically a public school education and along the way uh, studied a little bit here, a little bit there, and became a merchant. Uh, he'd be, uh, he studied uh, uh, a number of things, uh, particularly interested in being uh, in, pharma, in pharmaceuticals and worked with people in Alabama that way. And then, of course, when the uh, war between the states began, he joined the forces and served all four years. He worked, first of all, in the medical department, working, uh, taking forth with the, the knowledge he had of pharmaceuticals. And, but then they shifted him to become part of uh, education and training in the, in the uh, Confederate Army. And this became his, his sort of a penchant with him. And so he, he went back, he, when, he came, when the war ended, he went back to Alabama, again served as a merchant for a short time. But he moved to Pensacola in 1875, coming here from Greenville, because he saw, as many other people did at the time, that the lumbering era and the fishing uh, uh, industry here were bringing, uh, bringing prosperity to Pensacola, and the and prosperity meant opportunity. And so for the next 10 years, uh, uh, I guess we would say uh, Cook was a merchant, and he worked faithfully at did a good job. And then suddenly in 1885, opportunity seemed to knock for him. Now, it was in 1885 that Florida developed a, wrote and adopted a new constitution, a very different kind of constitution, and one had one key element in it. At this point in time, the members of our Pensacola, or rather our Scambia County School Board, would be elected rather than appointed by the governor. And the, these school board members now would appoint a school superintendent. Now, uh, Florida had, had, in its constitutions previously, had made provision for a public school system, but because the financing was so weak, nothing really had happened. There had been a few abortive efforts to create what we would today call simple one-room schools, and they just had not flown well. Now, the new school board, which, by the way, was composed of very prominent uh, leading citizens here, looked around and said, we have to have a man who was really devoted to education and can do a, a unique job for us. And they, they had several who applied for the work, and they chose Nathan B. Cook. And he took office as the superintendent in 1885. Now, at this point in time, the, the school system itself had half a dozen small schools, most of them inside the city of Pensacola. Most of the people, not all, but most of the people who were teachers then were poorly prepared. We had, there wasn't probably what we would today, we would say there was not a single college graduate among all of the teachers who were then practicing here. Uh, Cooks vowed that he was going to change that. And the, the school board members agreed with him. And so one of the first things Mr. Cook began to do was recruit. And he brought into the, into the, into the community here men who, had, who had, uh, had considerable advanced education. Each one of them bore the title of professor. There was Professor Patterson, Professor Tate, Professor Lockie. And these men brought a new era of prestige to the school system. And, of course, immediately uh, Cook looked around at the county and said, now, we have we've been helping a number of children in Pensacola, but the rural ch children of the of the community have been all but neglected, and of course this this meant a major major development for the system. Now, as he began his work, we want to remember that money, as, as it always has been, money was a problem for schools. They drew most of their income from a from a small portion, uh, parcel of property which had been given to the county for 
for use in developing schools. And the idea, of course, was the county would, would build on or lease or use that property, create an income to support the schools. But at this point in time, that was woefully short in, in the need. And so now it, was, it now became possible to levy an ad valorem tax addition on all of the uh, properties that were to be taxed within the community. And that additional money would, of course, go to support schools. Cook began with a total yearly budget of $5,000, and that was to support operations as well as any capital expenditures that would be made. And so you can see that uh, there had to be something done, and it was. Now, Cook immediately began his work trying to bring the school system into the rural community, and he did this in a unique way. He would go to a, an area of uh, and bring the, the farm families together <clears throat> and say, now look, uh, we will, if you will come together and do two things, we will make sure that you have a school for your children. The two things were this, you come together as a community and build a small schoolhouse, and then you agree that you will board a teacher. In other words, we will, the school system will bring into being a, a teacher and we'll pay that teacher, but that teacher will live in the community and, and probably move from family to family where they, where they would live and, and enjoy room and board. And the families agreed that they would do this. Now, then they went a step further. The farm families, the, the men usually, agreed that they would, they would share the, uh, the, the need for transporting the children from their farm homes to the school. And this meant, of course, that they used their horse and wagon, uh, taking what probably one farmer would take them in the morning, another would bring them back. And of course, since we were now beginning a rural school system, this began to dictate what the school year would look like. Because the farmer said, yes, we want our children to have an education, but we've got to have them here for the key times of clearing the land, of planting and harvesting. And so basically our school year, uh, which was to begin late in September at the, that time and end in May, that's the, that was the, the reason for the, the timing that we, ha we had then, and that basically we still have today, even though we are long since past the point of being a, an agricultural community as a whole. Well, the, the, the school system began in this way, and, and step by step, year by year, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cook uh, developed the, the plan, and he, he next moved to be going beyond professors Lockie and Tate and so forth to get other wonderful people coming in here. And these mostly were ladies, and many of the of the women who came here were were uh, were not local to begin with. But you have the names like uh, uh, Ali Anestra and Annie K. Souter, and the pe people of that kind were brought to the community because they had college degrees, and Mr. Mr. Uh, Tate, Mr. Cook felt that this was going to build his school system, and indeed it did. Now the next thing Cook turned to, of course, was the idea of what are we going to use for school textbooks? And he had a unique philosophy, and the school board backed him up. Mr. T Mr. Cook insisted <clears throat> that the families themselves buy the textbooks. These were not, textbooks were not given out by the schools, by the school board, because K Cook reasoned that if the family and the, and the boy or girl owned the book, they were going to take care of it and they were going to use it well. And that's the, basically the way they operated. And Mr. Cook, of course, studied very hard to determine what the, the various texts would be. And they worked, got all sorts of things, Barnes Geography, Gup McGuffey's Reader, things that uh, many times people have heard about as, uh, as kind of a, a throwback to the past. But he insisted on the, the, the state-of-the-art textbooks for his students. Now, he went beyond that. He, Mr. Mr. Cook realized there had to be some incentives to children, and he wanted, there were some areas that he wanted to be sure his, his classrooms and his, his, uh, his whole educational system focused on. He was, Mr. Cook had been a soldier, and he was a very patriotic citizen, and he insisted and put forth for the, uh, the curriculum each year a number of academic ele elements that dealt with the uh, understanding of the founding fathers, the core values of the, of the, of the republic, and all of these things were, were, were certainly drummed into the students by their teachers. Next, he, in, he uh, developed the idea of prizes. And he went to a number of people within the community, member of merchants within the community, and got them to, to establish annual awards that would be made for the, for the best work that was done by, uh, in some, most cases, by students, but in a few cases, by teachers. 
so that each spring when, when uh, the school year ended, prizes would be given uh, for all sorts of wonderful things. And uh, this, this continued on well, well, into the 20, uh, well into the 20th century. Another thing that, that, that Cook was insistent upon was an understanding of nature. He appreciated what was going on in the community, that we were, that all the prosperity of the area was, was dependent upon the trees and the things that, had, that nature had provided for us. And so such things as Arbor Day became areas of, or times of celebration within the community and, and various ceremonies were held so that the students would get an idea of what this was all about. Well, step by step, Mr. Cook and the school board began improving the, the, the uh, status of the schools all the way through the community. Uh, new, uh, better schools were built in Pensacola. In the, in, the, uh, in the rural areas, most of the time, up through the time that Mr. Cook uh, ended his, his career, uh, basically these were one or two room schools which the, which the community itself had built. And the, uh, they, they served well, and for the most part, one or two teachers was all that would be assigned for a particular area. And that's basically the way it continued. One, one particular example, of course, was uh, in the year 1900, when uh, the Alger Sullivan Lumber Company was created. Mr. Cook went to the, uh, to the owners and told them that he wanted to be, help them establish a school there. And they agreed quickly to provide a plot of land. And the Alger Sullivan Lumber Company built school, which was the first, first training center center then for, for children in the town of Century. So we move forward that way and we move into the end of the 20th century and Mr. Cook step by step by step begins to improve. Now by the time we get to the year 1905, the, what had been about 250 students in the first year of the system in 1885, it's now grown to over 4,000. We now have a, what, we would, what they then called a, the Pensacola High School. Now, the, the original high school only went to the 10th grade, but it was a, a marked, marked improvement. And by the time we get to the 19, 7, 8, 9, we now begin to see that more and more young ladies, more young girls are, are attending school or going beyond just a few grades because the families now recognize that this is a great opportunity and uh, something that had been lacking in the past now began to move forward, again, under, under Cook's pressure. Well, we move forward just a little bit more into the year 1900. And 12. At that point in time, something happened which is a little difficult to explain, but it, it's there as a, as a mark of history. It was in, in that year that the state legislature decided they were going to change the way certain things were done. And they, they, they continued to, have, to arrange for school boards to be po uh, pop, uh, popularly elected, but now they changed the arrangement for school superintendents. Instead of, being appoint, instead of being appointed by the, boards, the school boards, now the school superintendent would be elected too. And so coming up to the year 1912, the fall of 1912, Mr. Cook, who had served as the superintendent now for 28 years, had competition, he had to run for election. Well, as all this began, people went to him and said, well, of course you're going to run a, a campaign. We want to have you continue in office. But Mr. Cook said, no. He said, I, I, people know me. I've been here for, for all these years. They know what I've done. They know what I stand for. I'm, I'm not going to print cards and posters and things like that. They know me. and that, That's where I stand. Uh, he had one competitor. Uh, a man who had come to Pensacola fairly recently and who had become the bookkeeper for the school system. His name was A.S. Edwards. And Mr. Edwards wanted the job. And so he campaigned vigorously. And when the, uh, when the election was held and the ballots were counted, Mr. Edwards had been elected. Well, Mr. Cook took the, the defeat very graciously and he made very sure that everything was in transition to the new superintendent. And once the uh, 1913 uh, uh, began, Mr. Edwards became our superintendent and incidentally would serve over two different periods, serve in a, a very fine role as the superintendent, a very successful man. Mr. Cook uh, was stepped aside, but he was very quickly invited to take on other community service positions, which he did. And he lived on for another dozen years before uh, nature took him away. But nonetheless, as we look back, N.B. Cook, beginning in 1885, was really the father of our school system. Under, we're serving under many very able school boards. He worked well, raised the budgets, built schools, uh, put in a strong curriculum, brought in new teachers, just did a job that built a system which has survived very well. So when we talk about who was the father of the system, remember Nathan Burrell Cook, Civil War veteran, pharmacist, teacher, he was at the beginning.